Welcome to Kilobots 24 at Spectrum 2013, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan at the University. My name's Curtis and beside me here is Ethan. Hello. Starting off our first fight will be uh, the ant weight competition. These are one pound robots. The ant weight robots are typically um, more airborne than their beetle weight cousins because they uh, use similar motors but weigh a lot less so they have a lot of they have a lot of, they do a lot more flying around and bouncing off walls than beetle weight. In the blue square is Roadrunner and its opponent in the red square is Iron Infidel. So both of these robots are, as Curtis mentioned, are one pound robots, but they're very different. Uh, Iron Infidel has a spinning weapon on the front, which you can see spinning up there. And uh, Roadrunner just has a, a steel wedge on the front. So it's a simple, more simple robot. The idea of a kilobot match, of course, is to disable your opponent either by wrecking it, uh, bashing weapons and such, or there's also the option of pushing them outside the arena. Each driver gets to decide whether his push-out will be open or closed. Most weaponed robots will keep theirs closed, keep the opponent inside the arena as long as possible. And most pushing or wedge robots will open theirs in hopes of pushing the opponent out. So it looks like Ro Roadrunner there had a little bit of a drive issue on his, uh, I guess that's his left wheel there, but it seems to be cleared up now. Driving around much better than he was a few seconds ago. Iron Infidel is running around. Uh, looks like the weapon may have been disabled there on a big hit. Doing his best to sh still show aggression to the judges. Oh, the oh weapon there it still goes. works again. Roadrunner trying to get behind. Not hit that weapon right head on if you can. So matches are scored on uh, control and aggression if they, if they last the full three minutes. If a robot's not destroyed, then it goes to a judge's decision, and a uh, judge's decisions are based on control, damage, and aggression. So both of these robots are trying to control the match and show some form of aggression, not just spend the three minutes running away. Roadrunner doing most of the chasing here. It looks like Iron Infidel might be trying to back up and get his weapon running again. Well, maybe nice. Iron Infidel appears to be ramming now with his front end. Ah, uh, weapon might be disabled then. If Roadrunner can't push Iron Infidel out the side in the three minutes end... Oh, look, he's trying to, he's trying to feint him towards the push out there. See if he falls for it. If it does go to a judge's decision, they're going to have to look at the damage done to both robots. And damage not only includes damage done by a weapon, but damage done to yourself. So even though... Roadrunner doesn't have a weapon, the, the disabled weapon on Iron Infidel is going to count against him. Uh, looks like Roadrunner might have that drive issue again with that left wheel. Well, if a robot can't show controlled mobility, it does get counted out after 15 seconds. So Iron Infidel, if he's smart, will just leave him alone and let the count out continue. Yeah, Roadrunner was counted out after 15 seconds of immobility and the win goes to Iron Infidel. So coming up now is uh, another Fingertech Robotics robot, Kitbot in the red square, and his opponent in the blue square, Shooter McGavin. So similar to the last fight, Shooter has a spinning blade and Kitbot just has a wedge on the front, so let's see how much different it is. These bots have met up in the past. Uh, normally there's a lot of sheared off screw heads and squared off wheels uh, due to the blade, the very low blade on Shooter McGavin. Spins in incredibly fast and he seems to have added uh, a little peg out the back of the robot because once in a while he'll get stuck on his back and just like that, but now he's able to fall back onto his wheels. Uh, that would have been the end of the fight in the past, but it looks like improvements have, have done him well. Kitbot's going to try and show as much, as much control and aggression as possible. He has no weapon. He's going to try and aim Iron, or Shooter McGavin out the red push out there. But due to the shape of Shooter McGavin, uh, he seems to just go underneath all the time. Shooter seems to be taking some chunks off those foam wheels there. Kempot will start bouncing a little bit when he drives now. 
Yeah, the robot's gonna get lower and lower as those wheels get shaved down. It's always a good idea to bring lots of spare wheels to an event. The plow on Kitbot is made of uh, 0.04 inch thick titanium, the same as the blade on Shooter McGavin. Oh, right near the push out there. Oh, but he got away. Oh, oh the blade still works. Kitbot is actually made from a kit sold by Fingertech Robotics. The base plate, wheels, electronics, all the guts are part of the kit, and the only things that have been added are, of course, the titanium plow on top, um, formed at home, I'm told, and then uh, some bearing blocks to support the motors a little better than what's come with the, with the kit. And the pushing robot, if really all you have is your pushing, you want to make sure that that never dies on you, so you add as much support to that as you can. Both robots still seem to be in working order. No major damage has occurred during this fight yet. There's some scratches on Kitbot's web. Yeah, it's really up to Kitbot either to push Shooter McGavin out the push out or to show incredible control and aggression. He's doing a good job by making sure that Shooter's blade does more damage to the walls of the arena than to Kitbot itself. If he can keep slamming him into the walls, he can try and break that blade. Oh, he's got it stopped there. Nope, start it up again. Lots of foam off those wheels, though, but they're still working. We're just going to go to a judge's decision because both robots are still working. So the judges have decided Kitbot is the winner in the red spot. So loading into the arena now is another one pound fight. So in the red square we have Toothless who has an overhead spinning blade. I think it's the largest blade in the Antway class uh, at this tournament. And in the blue square we have Metroid who is a former number, ranked number one in the world uh, robot who has a spinning drum on the front. Ooh, big hit there. And Toothless is upside down. He almost hit Metroid out that push out but not quite. If Metroid would have hit that small gap uh, between the slanted walls there, he would have been out of the arena and he would have lost that fight. Oh, and smartly, Toothless taps out rather than getting attacked while upside down with his guts exposed. A good hit off the start, though. That's something you got to worry about when you're designing your robot. If it does get flipped upside down or into any position it normally wouldn't be in, can it self-right itself? I would have expected the blade would be able to spin up and, and flip the robot back up again, but it looks like there's just not enough power in that weapon motor. It must be geared more towards speed than torque. You can see the builders comparing damage on that big hit. Both robots still in working order though. One pound fight. Both of these robots are from Team Acme, but Team Acme has two builders on it, so each one gets to drive their own robot. In the blue square, Roadrunner in his second fight of the event. Got a little ding in the front armor, but he's reattached the, the steel wedge. Red Square has Toothless. We'll see if, uh, if he's fixed that self-writing problem that he had in the first match. Toothless spins up. There's a little helicopter maneuver. Roadrunner's taking it gently and see if he can convince Toothless to maybe damage himself against a wall or something before taking the blade on himself. Looks like Roadrunner almost fits right under Toothless's blade. The benefit of very small robots. Oh, Toothless upside down again. Trying to spin the weapon. Oh, Roadrunner is quickly pushes him out to push out. Win goes to Roadrunner. You can't self-right yourself quickly. Uh, the other robot will take advantage of it.
One pound fight here we have in the blue square kit bot by Fingertech Robotics. And his opponent in the red square is Iron Lotus with that clamping arm. Kitbot's coming off a win against Shooter McGavin. He's got new wheels on there. They were flattened off against the blade. It's a good thing, too. He needs all of his driving expertise in this match. Iron Lotus there by Rumble Robotics trying to redeem his brother, Shooter McGavin, who'd lost to Kitbot in an earlier match, also from the same driver. Kitbot's got to avoid that clamp. If Iron Lotus can get him, he's able to drive him over to the open push-out. Kitbot seems to have the lower of the two wedges and able to get under Iron Lotus the majority of the time. Kitbot's been in over 100 matches now. It's quite an old robot, went through a lot of upgrades, but the, the base of it is the same as it ever started out. That means a lot of driving practice for this particular robot. You can also see a lot of the old scars from previous fights. It's missing a couple teeth from the wedge. That's a thick titanium plow and that is not easy to break so you know he's been up against some devastating robots. A little bit slow on the clamp there, a couple dimes from Iron Lotus. Looks like the top armor, if you can call it armor, it's more of just an electronics shield, is starting to come loose on Iron Lotus. That could be a problem later on. Kitbot definitely has a speed advantage here. Able to do circles around Iron Lotus. Kitbot aptly named, it's built from a kit sold by Fingertech Robotics. Really this robot was made uh, in an attempt to show how well the kit could do and it seems that it's showing it pretty well here. The only upgrades were the titanium plow, uh, extra batteries inside, that's where you see the more speed coming from, and some shaft supports on the wheels. Neither of these robots is pushed out of that open push-out in the three-minute fight. It will go to a judge's decision. Judging is based on damage and aggression and as well as control. Both these robots are trying to show as much control and aggression as possible because neither of them have very destructive weapons. I don't know if the judges are going to count that electronics flap as being damaged or not. It's dislodged, but it doesn't seem to be affecting the performance of Iron Lotus at all. Looks like it's gone to a judge's decision. And the judges have decided. The judges have decided that Kitbot is the winner. Turned out pretty good. I was able to get under him uh, from anywhere but the front of his robot. Luckily, mine I think is faster, so I could get around the sides and the back. Loading into the arena now in the blue square is a robot named Metroid. He's a veteran of this event. His opponent in the red square, Shooter McGavin. Both robots have weapons here, so we might see a really quick match if they hit properly, or maybe they can last the whole three minutes. Metroid's spinning drum does a good job of uppercutting the other robots, where Shooter McGavin is a horizontal blade. He'll be knocking Metroid to the side. Oh, and it looks like Shooter McGavin was knocked right out the push-out by Metroid. Quick and decisive victory for Metroid. Although Shooter can drive upside down, his weapon was not hitting Metroid when he was upside down. Loading in now in the red square, Iron Lotus with the clamping arms. His opponent in the blue square, Road Runner with the steel wedge. Two pushy robots, one with a clamp, but there won't be much damage. This is going to come down to control and aggression. Oh, 
And Lotus getting a couple good clamps on Roadrunner, but Roadrunner really doesn't have any edges to grip onto. Oh, there he's got him. Edging him towards the push out. Can he get him out or not? Oh, so close. In this match, only one of the pushouts is open. Normally with pushy wedge matches, you'd see both of them open. Each driver gets to determine whether his pushout is open or closed, so usually it's the weaponed robots who will close theirs, trying to keep the other opponent inside as long as they can to deal maximum damage. But when you've got a pushy robot, you need to try and get the other guy out of the arena, and so you would lower your pushout. Iron Lotus showing good control here. Lots of clamping. Roadrunner doing his best to get behind Iron Lotus, where he can get under the wedge. Push him into a corner. Roadrunner looks a lot smaller than Iron Lotus, but they are the same weight. Oh, and he does a, a mistake there, drives himself out. Iron Lotus wins. Now, our ant weights Kitbot in the blue corner, Iron Lotus in the red corner. This fight is actually going to determine third place. If Kitbot wins, he's going to move on and will have to come up against his teammate, Iron Infidel. The loser of this will have third place. This is the B-side of the double elimination tournament, so the winner of this will move to the final, uh, but they'll have to win twice in order to secure first place. Kitbot's previous loss was actually only a forfeit to his same teammate, Iron Infidel. So it hasn't actually lost in the tournament yet, but forfeits do count in the brackets. These two robots have met before. And it was a win in favor of Kitbot last time. We'll see if he can pull it off again. Iron Lotus seems to be quicker on the draw with that clamp this time. Getting a couple good clamps on Kitbot. Kitbot not letting up though. Keeping on good aggression. Slamming Iron Lotus against the arena wall, trying to dislodge something. Both robots have gone out the push out. Now if only one had, this would be a, a win. But since both have gone out at the same time, the robots will be restarted. And the time will continue from where it was paused. Close up the arena again and the fight will continue. Doesn't appear to be any damage to either robot. So this one may come down to the judges if nobody gets pushed out by the end of the three minutes. 
Kipot flips Iron Lotus onto his back, but that clamping arm makes a good writing mechanism. Kipot manages to throw Iron Lotus out the push out there and carefully, being careful not to go out himself this time. So Iron Lotus is taking third place. So Kipot was the winner of that fight. So Kipot will move on to the finals to fight his teammate Iron Infidel. However, since both robots are on the same team, uh, Fingertech will decide which of their robots will take first place. Fingertech decides that Kitbot is going to be the winner, so first place goes to Kitbot, second to Iron Infidel, and third to Iron Lotus. At the end of every event, we like to have what's called the Royal Rumble. Any robot that's still moving in that weight class gets to go in and last man standing wins. So we've got in the blue square, Shooter McGavin, red square, Metroid. Uh, in the bottom right, Roadrunner and Kitbot. And at the top, you would see one of the rookie robots, Lift. There was a rookie class added to this tournament for new builders only. You can actually buy kits from Fingertech Robotics and enter them into these events. Metroid takes his revenge on Shooter and sends him out the arena. Sends Kitbot out as well. Roadrunner and Lift, and <laughs> Roadrunner and Metroid going at it. Lift doing his best. It looks like he's had to add on a wedge in the back, so he's actually driving backwards from what he was in the rookie tournament. Goes for a fly. Looks like Lift's radio antenna is sticking out a bit. Roadrunner pushes Metroid out. It's down to the two pushy wedge robots. Oh, and he quickly puts Lift out too. Roadrunner's the winner of this rumble. Not without damage. Now we're on the beetle weight tournament brackets. Beetle weights are three pound robots, three times as heavy as their ant weights, ant weight cousins. There are similar ideas behind building beetle weights. You want to do as much destruction as possible. But with three times the weight, you see a lot more power going into these weapons. In the red square, a robot named Underkill with a low spinning titanium blade. And in the blue square, Low Blow. And also, Low Blow also has a spinning blade. It's a lot larger than Underkill's, but the whole robot in general is larger. Underkill, I, I've seen inside, it's a very dense robot. It actually has magnets for wheels, so even though the weight distribution isn't as perfect as you'd like it, it can get around easily with those magnet wheels. Oh, looks like the low blow has eaten himself somehow. I think a titanium guard actually came off the robot, and as he flew to the other side of the arena, he actually picked it up and jammed it inside his own weapon. That's an easy win for Underkill. All those sparks are coming off the weapon guard. There it is, flying across the arena. One more hit will send the robot flying. And there it is, he picks up his own guard and jams his weapon. An unfortunate loss for Loblo. All right, here we have another three pound fight. In the red square, we have another drum bot spinning a vertical four blades as Amp from Team Acme Robotics. And in the blue square, we have T6 from DBM. T6 is an interesting robot. You don't see a lot like him. He's actually called a ring spinner. The entire outside ring of that robot spins around and it has, I believe, six steel teeth on it. Looks like Amp's been turned upside down right off the start. I think I saw a broken belt there too, so we won't be able to use his drum to self-right. Another quick match, the win is gonna go to T6. Not enough on that low ring spinner for Amp to get a good bite on to do some throwing. It looks like the belt was doing all right, but the, it might have slipped itself into the path of the weapon teeth. The robot typically doesn't last very long, so I thought I should stop hitting him while it was still running. 
Loading in now another Beetleweight three pound robot fight in the red square is Team Acme's robot Taz with a saw blade near to the ground. Blue square is opponent Supervillain. Actually has a dual weapon system. On the top is a lifter arm and there's a drum spinning on the front. Once he lifts the robot he tries to get to the bottom of them which is usually less armored than the rest of the robot. His lifting arm also doubles as a self-writing mechanism, so if he gets caught upside down, he can use that arm to pop himself back onto his wheels. Big hit from Taz right off the start. Taz trying to get his weapon up to full speed before he goes attacking. Looks like the spin-up time is a little slower than Team Acme would like on that blade. Lots of white sparks coming off the titanium. He's got the blade jammed up. I suppose that lifting arm could also be used as a clamp. If he can clamp on the other robot and maybe direct him towards the side. Push that blade right into the steel wall of the arena. Oh, Taz is now upside down, but he is an invertible robot, meaning he can drive both right side up and upside down. No need for self-writing mechanisms there. Like a googly eye was sacrificed there. Supervillain showing control in this part of the match. Robots are allowed to pin other robots for 15 seconds, and when you have them in a clamp like that, it does count as pinning. It shows control to the judges, but we want to see fighting, so after 15 seconds, they must let go and continue with the damage. Both spinning weapons seem to have... Oh, nope. Supervillain's weapon is still going and chewing up pieces of Taz's armor. Taz getting his blade back up to speed. Trying to, at least. I wonder if there's any teeth left on that carbide blade. They look, they look bent, at least. Both robots have such good armor, I can't see them getting through each other to the, to the precious innards, the electronics, and damaging them. Does some damage to the lifting arm of Supervillain. Taz is slowly moving out of the corner. there. There's another googly eye. Oh, and Taz is back on its right side up. Supervillain taking a lot of gouges out of the back armor, but those are purely cosmetic. If it doesn't rip the armor off or get through it, it really doesn't affect the other robot. It's like after three minutes, this one's going to have to go to a judge's decision. And the judges have decided that Supervillain has won that fight. Here we're setting up a three pound beetleweight fight. This is on the B side of the bracket, so whichever robot loses will be out. In the red square, Angry Dragon looks like he's got that shell spinning now. And in the blue square, his opponent Ados, the titanium wedge in the front. Fight starts, and oh, Angry Dragon does have trouble spinning up. Ados being very kind and letting him get it going before starting the match. These builders like to put on a show just as much as they like to win. So Angry Dragon has a, it's what we call a shell spinner, it has a spinning shell all the way the, around the outside of the robot, so the armor is also the weapon in that design. That shell spins around three or 4,000 RPM, has sharpened titanium teeth welded onto it. 
Does a lot of damage. As you can see, the wedge on Ados is starting to get bent up and come loose. Magnet wheels help keep Angry Dragon on the ground. Normally with a shell spinner like this, you would see it coining all over the arena, acting like a pinball. But it has very good control here. Gotta do his best to stay away from that push out. Driving a shell spinner is interesting. You really can't see inside the robot. All you can see is the whir of the shell, so Greg has to drive based on the antenna sticking out the top and which way that little wire is pointing. So if you ever see him going the wrong direction, it's because he just can't tell which way the robot is pointing. Ados showing lots of aggression. Keeps attacking that spinning shell, trying to push him into the wall and slow him down. Oh, and he's stopped the shell. Looks like the shell has taken some damage. One of the welds may have cracked. You can see along the bottom edge there, if you look on Angry Dragon, the bottom ring of the shell seems to be falling off a little bit. Not sure if that's what has stopped the weapon. Or if maybe that was already there and he fought with it anyway. After multiple tournaments, these robots uh, can show up to a fight looking like they had just finished one. The ring magnet wheels on Angry Dragon give it quite a bit of pushing power as long as he doesn't go up the wedge of Ados. Ados, of course, trying to make sure that's the only place he goes. You can see Ados' wedge there is a little bit looser now after multiple hits from Angry Dragon. Still, still holding on, though. Looks like the screws have come a bit loose. A lot of vibration when it's being hit thousands of times by teeth. If neither robot's going to be pushed out here. Doesn't look like there's going to be any more damage in this fight. It might go to a judge's decision. So if this goes to a judge's decision, which it looks like it will right away, Ados is probably going to have more points on aggression, but Angry Dragon will probably have more points on damage. So we'll have to see who comes out on top. Remembering that the damage to your own weapon counts against you, so uh, slowing down and stopping the weapon of Angry Dragon is going to count big points for Ados. And it looks like Ados was the winner of that last fight. Getting ready to go, we've got another three pound beetle weight fight in the red square, Ados, and his opponent in the blue square, Low Blow. Both of these robots from the same team. But Dirk has decided to put on a show for the audience, not forfeit one of the robots into the winner's square. He swapped out his standard blade on Low Blow for an abrasive disc, so it'll make a lot more sparks on that titanium wedge of Ados while saving both from excessive damage. Smart of him to do because he would have to fix the damage on both robots after this fight anyway. You can see all the white sparks from the titanium wedge and the occasional yellow-orange spark from the steel bolts on the wedge. I imagine by the end of this fight, Ados is going to have a stripe all the way around the robot of buffed up or scraped off metal. Some kind of whirlwind technique there. See some sparks from the arena there. The abrasive disc puts on a good show, but without aggressive teeth on it, it's not going to catch on the other robot, and it's probably not going to do much damage. There is one push out open, so Ados is trying to maneuver low blow towards it. This being the B side of the bracket, whichever of these robots wins will go on but the loser will be out of the tournament. Killabots normally fights double elimination tournaments, meaning even if you lose once, you have another chance to come back up the B side and take first place. Ados looks to have been trying to lure Lobo to the edge, but might have gone off himself there.
three minutes just about up. Looks like Dirk has decided that Low Blow should be the winner of this fight, so Ados has backed himself out and saved them from a judge's decision. And Low Blow is indeed the winner of this fight, and we'll move on up the B side. Maybe cut the screw heads off on the wedge, take his wedge off, but didn't quite get that far. Basically just keep driving straight into him and throwing sparks. Just trying to put on a show. Another fight on the B side of the three pound weight class. This is Amp versus Supervillain. Whoever wins this will go on to fight again, but the loser will be out of the tournament. Don's closing this push out there, so both push outs will be closed for this fight, meaning it will be a fight to the death or it will last three minutes. Both weapons spin up. Two vertical spinning drums. When they hit each other, you get to see which one spins faster. A slower robot usually goes for a ride. These ones are fairly evenly matched. Ah, I think Amp has the advantage there. We'll see if Supervillain can right himself. That arm was damaged earlier in a fight during Taz, I do believe, and I don't know if Travis had enough time to fix it between fights. It's looking a little vulnerable right now. Supervillain sitting there hoping Amp will hit him one more time and maybe knock him back onto his wheels. Close. Often the builders, rather than leave it to a count out, will try and continue the fight. Well, I don't know if Supervillain can get out of that one, though. He seems to be stuck on the arena wall. Looks like Amp is just going to leave him there. Oh, or maybe not. Oh, Supervillain got off the wall. The fight continues. Both weapons still working. The writing arm or the clamping arm on Supervillain doesn't seem to be moving at all. On his back again. Amp seems to be having trouble with his left drive wheel. Can only spin in circles right now. So, Amp's not going to take any more hits. He seems to have problems driving, but he can still move a little bit, and Supervillain is stuck on his back, so the win goes to Amp. Speedaway fight loading in, we have in the blue square the robot T6 with his shell spinner, and the red square is opponent Broadside. Broadside has a, one of the thickest, if not the thickest, titanium wedge in the tournament, and T6 has that ring spinner we talked about earlier. The ring has advantages over a shell spinner in that this robot can operate upside down. You see the wheels sticking out the top. If he does get flipped upside down, he can still operate. One of the steel teeth laying on the floor there. It's okay, he had six to start with. Oh, and he looks like he's flipped broadside upside down. Broadside normally invertible. Seems to be having drive problems. Well, he won't be getting out of that one though. His wheels are no longer touching the ground. Unless T6 helps him. Uh, looks like T6 is just gonna leave broadside for the rest of the fight. And the wind goes to T6. These hits must have done a lot of damage internally to Broadside. Knocking a receiver or maybe a speed controller loose, possibly the battery. I didn't think it was going to last so long and I broke a tooth off of it though. It's supposed to keep hitting. So I think what I'll do is take the one off the other side and it'll be balanced and I'll be back to fight again. Loading up now, we have a Beetleweight fight in the red square amp with its spinning drum and in the blue square underkill. Underkill is one of the oldest robots in this Beetleweight bracket. It's been around five years now. Amp is a fairly new robot. Still working out some of the bugs, but he's been doing all right in this tournament. This is a B-side fight, so the loser of this fight will be eliminated from the tournament. And the winner will move on up to the B-side.
both pushouts are closed, so we will see hopefully some destruction in this fight. Weapons spin up. Underkill's having a little trouble. Camp spins up instantly and takes chase. Underkill's going now. Both weapons hitting each other. Steel Teeth versus Titanium Teeth. Underkill having a little trouble moving. His weapon seems to have come off. It is now in the bottom right side of the arena. So he has no weapon. Neither robot can drive very well. That weapon looks disabled as well. This may turn into a pushing match with two half-disabled robots. It looks like Amp actually lost the wheel, whereas Underkill may have just lost the drive motor. Since neither robot is going to be pushing the other one out, both pushouts were closed. This is going to go to a judge's decision at the end of three minutes, and the judges will have to decide based on the damage done in the first few hits who was the winner. Underkill seems to be driving around much better now. Since the Amp is the only robot now who can't show controlled motion, he will likely be counted out right away. Amp has been disqualified by the referee. The win is going to go to Underkill. Shaft that holds the motor together is loose, so it just pulled apart. Still one because I was still driving at the end. That's the only thing that saved me. Getting ready to fight now, Underkill and Broadside. Underkill's blade came off in the last match, but Builder Greg has been able to reattach it. Looks like it's spinning again. Broadside with his thick titanium wedge is going to try and take the brunt of that attack right at the front of the robot. Underkill spins up, gets to full speed before Broadside gets there. Well, the blade is slowed down though. Looks like he's having a little trouble. Broadside not worried about the blade. He's sure he can take those hits. Underkill runs away a bit, tries to get his blade up to speed again. Broadside trying to edge him towards the push out. Doesn't work. Underkill's blade seems to be going full speed now. See if we can get some good hits. You can catch an edge. It'll do a lot more damage than hitting the titanium on the front. Broadside trying to push Underkill into the wall. It's a good strategy. Use the arena to your advantage. Underkill lays off on the weapon because he doesn't want the wall to do any damage to his robot. Very close to the push out now. Broadside trying to get Underkill just a little bit further. Underkill has magnets for wheels, as you see there. So it's really hard getting him off the floor. Oh, it looks like Underkill was able to spin up the weapon while on top of Broadside. Came down and tore the weapon off on him. There won't be any more damage in this match. We'll see who can do a better job of pushing each other around. Of course, the damage done to Underkill is that he lost his weapon, and that does count against him. And the time is up on that fight, so it will go to a judge's decision. And the judges have decided in favor of Broadside.
just to try to stay on the, keep the wheels down and the top up. <laughs> Here now, we're near the end of the tournament. This is going to be for second and third place. In the red square, our robot T6, the, sh the ring spinner. And in the blue square, his opponent Broadside. These two met up earlier in the competition and it ended with Broadside upside down and T6 taking the, the victory there. Let's see if Broadside can redeem himself this time. T6 has some good speed on that ring spinner. He's reattached the teeth or at least balanced them again. Oh, and he coins out. A big hit onto Broadside, but unfortunately out the push out. Broadside will take second place in the Beetleweight division of this tournament, and third place will go to T6. A bit of luck comes into these events. Right out the open push out. A little of both. I got him up and he put himself out. <laughs> Up now we have the finals of the Beetleweight weight class. Whichever robot wins here will take first place in the tournament. In the red square we have Underkill and his opponent in the blue square, Utopia. Utopia is a larger version of the one pound ant weight Metroid built by the same team, same driver. Works on the same principles, he's got sharpened teeth on the drum, tries to give an uppercut to his opponent where Underkill has the blade spinning low to the ground. Underkill seems to have some problems with getting his, or keeping his weapon up to speed this fight, as we've seen in earlier fights this tournament. Utopia has no trouble chasing Underkill around, trying to get hits anywhere but the front of the robot. Oh, and the blade comes off of Underkill. Utopia's weapon still in working order, I do believe. No, oh, maybe not. Utopia's weapon is looks like it could be dead. Can still spin slowly. He's got a little life left there. Damage to Underkill is greater than the damage to Utopia. Looks like Underkill knocked off the spacers keeping Utopia's drum off the ground, so now whenever Utopia spins, he seems to bounce the front end of his robot up and down. Both robots now trying to show some aggression. Ramming the other robot. Trying to push towards the push-outs. However, both push-outs look like they are closed for this fight, as both robots were hoping to destroy the other robots. You can fight. see the rear armor in Utopia has a lot of gashes through it, as a thanks to Underkill. Might have jammed against one of the wheels. Oh, Utopia flipped himself upside down and is, can now drive much better. And Underkill does not appear to be moving. Underkill not moving will be counted out. The win goes to Utopia, first place. So for that middleweight division, Utopia takes first place, second place goes to Broadside, and third place goes to T6. Now that the Beetleweight tournament is done, all the robots that are still working are thrown into the arena one last time for the Rumble. In the red square we have Utopia, in the blue square we have two robots from the same team, Low Blow and Broadside. Supervillain is in the top left and the bottom right is Taz. Utopia drives himself out by accident. As follows suit. A little bit of help from Loblo. Loblo seems to have lost the belt. Drives himself out. It may look like Supervillains won, but back in the corner where Loblo started, is actually Broadside, the other robot from Chaos Robotics. Dirk decided to put two robots in. He just needs to wake the transmitter up so that he's able to control Broadside. Supervillain having some drive issues with his left drive motor, but still able to crab walk over and get some hits on Broadside before the robot gets going. If you'd like to enter the tournaments, they're open to everyone. Go to killabots.com. You can introduce yourself there and send an email to the organizers. 
to find out what it takes to get in. Kits are available, or you can build your own from scratch. New builders are all, always welcomed in the club. Killabots has opened a new rookie weight class for new builders. You don't have to worry about going up against five-year veterans in your first time out. You'll be up against other new builders like yourself. Builders are always happy to give help and advice to new entries. If you have any questions about building your robot or what is and isn't legal, feel free to ask the builders that have been in this for a while. We'll be happy to help. In addition, the club also puts on uh, workshops two or three times every year, just going over the basics of what you need to buy, what you need to get to build a combat robot. And again, all this information can be found on the club website at kilobots.com. Supervillain seems to have stopped working and is stuck by the wall there, so Broadside will win this Beetleweight Rumble. Thanks for watching Kilobots 24, brought to you by Sastel.